I get asked quite often if I can recommend a camera and lens for wildlife and especially for bird photography. So it should be one that is fast, has good autofocus, a lot of reach and there's always a catch. It should also be light and compact and not too expensive. So today I have two cameras here that I tested and used quite extensively. One is the Panasonic Lumix G9 Mark II with the 100 to 400 mm f4 to f6.3. And on the other hand, we have the Canon R10 with the RF 100 to 500 millimeters. So they have different sensor sizes. Here we have a micro four thirds and here an APS-C body. But in the end, both of these combinations give you an effective focal length of up to 800 millimeters, uh, which is quite a lot and certainly sufficient for most type of bird photography. But they both have different strengths and weaknesses. And I want to talk about these features and my experiences with both systems to hopefully help you in case you were thinking about buying one of these. Let's start with some of the key characteristics and what I noticed when using the cameras and lenses in the field. So the G9 Mark II with the 100 to 400 weighs around 1.7 kilograms and that is with the SD card, battery and the tripod foot included. On the other hand, we have the R10 and the 100 to 500 that is a bit heavier, around 300 grams heavier, coming at two kilograms. Again, also with tripod uh, foot, SD card and the battery. For both systems, if you want to be a bit lighter and have it a bit more compact, you can remove the tripod foot or even the whole tripod collar on the RF 100 to 500. In terms of size, you can already see there's a bit of a difference, but if we uh, put them to the minimum size and we take off the lens hood here and reverse it for storing in the backpack, for example, um, then we get a, a length here of around 27 centimeters. If we do the same here, um, we get around 24 centimeters. As you have seen, both are so-called external zooms, meaning they extend if you zoom in, but the lens hood is quite different. So here we have this traditional lens hood that you need to uh, kind of take off and turn around and attach again. In the Panasonic, we have kind of an integrated lens hood that you can just flip out like this or push out like this and pull back in if you don't need it. So that's definitely faster, quicker access. You cannot drop it. Um, on the other hand, I'm a bit concerned if you shoot a lot of backlit or having a bit of sun from the side that this one is not very, not very deep. So it will probably not cover as much or shade as much of the lens as the bigger one here. In terms of costs, both of these kits are very similar. In Switzerland, this one is 3,110 Swiss francs, this one 3,230. I will put the prices of euros and US dollars above so that you can check there. But it might really depend also a bit on the season. Sometimes there is some cashback offers and you can really have a nicer deal than what I'm saying here. The Lumix G9 Mark II has a micro four thirds sensor that comes with typical uh, 4 to 3 aspect ratio, whereas the R10 has a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor that comes with the more traditional 3 to 2 aspect ratio that you are also used from film. You can see that the G9 Mark II is the clearly more professional camera. It's a lot bigger, it has more buttons and also dials that can also be assigned with specific function. Um, it has two SD card slots, it has a bigger battery, which you really feel in the real world. And what I noticed the most actually was that the viewfinder is much larger. It has a resolution of 3.8 million dots and the magnification of around 0.8. This one has a um, resolution of 2.4 million dots and their uh, magnification is 0.6. This might not sound like a big difference, but 0.6 and 0.8 magnification is a huge difference. Even when coming from a Canon R5, which I believe has a magnification of 0.76, um, going to the Lumix, you can already feel that the Lumix has a bigger viewfinder. Since both of these cameras are crop bodies, the effective focal length is kind of not what is written here on the lens, but you need to multiply it. 
um, for the micro four thirds system here. This means that this gets effectively in turned into a 200 to 800 millimeter zoom, whereas for the Canon it's 160 to 800 millimeters. So both reach 800 millimeters. For the Canon you have a bit more flexibility on the lower end. Even though I expect for wildlife photography, many people will not use that so often. Both of the lenses are very well suited for close-ups as well. The Lumix has a, a minimum focus distance of 1.3 meter, the Canon 1.2 meter, and this yields to a magnification of 0.33. And here we have 0.25, but in the end, since we have a smaller sensor here, in the end, uh, the image will appear or the object will appear in a quite comparable size in the final picture. So let's move to image quality. Keep in mind that we have a micro four thirds and the APS-C camera. So if it gets dark, you cannot expect the same performance as with a full frame camera. Generally speaking, when I was taking pictures during uh, daylight, when the sun was shining, I had no issues whatsoever. If it got a bit darker, like if I was in the forest or shooting close to dusk or dawn, um, or maybe on a rainy or heavily overcast day, and you push this ISO a bit more, you can see the downsides of these sensors. And I wanted to compare them here a bit. So the first test I did was at 400 ISO with the G9 Mark II. And on the R10, I set it to 500 ISO. Why different ISO? Well, the um, G9 II with the 100 to 400 has a maximum aperture of 6.3. The Canon RF 100 to 500 has a maximum aperture of f7.1. And I think the scenario is very realistic that you shoot wide open, but you want a certain minimum shutter speed. So let's say a 500th of a second or whatever to freeze the action. And then this just results in the Canon being one third higher in the ISO. And if we look at the comparison of the RAW file here zoomed in, I think we can agree that the noise levels are very comparable, but I feel like the Canon R10 is definitely showing a bit more details. If we move, the ISO up by two stops, so we are at 1600 or 2000 ISO. Um, the noise is still comparable, but again, the Canon shows a bit more detail. Finally, we go even higher at 6400 ISO on the Panasonic and 8000 on the Canon. Now it seems like to be almost unusable. There is just a lot of noise, but there is still some detail. So if we denoise the file, it actually looks quite good in my opinion on both cameras. I feel like with these denoised files, the R10 has a slight advantage in terms of noise and also an advantage in terms of sharpness. Um, but the difference is not huge and generally the lower you are with the ISO, the less you will see the difference between these two cameras. For wildlife photography, a good autofocus system is very important. So first of all, both have a joystick in, on the back of the camera, which is very nice if you want to move the autofocus point around but they also feature the animal eye detection autofocus that works very well on birds, some mammals. With insects, I find it's a bit more a hit and miss, um, which is very useful. And here I feel that the Canon R10 has the advantage if it's about detecting a subject. It was just a bit quicker. If it's about tracking it and consistently staying on the subject, both systems were handling it more or less comparable and both are not top of the class or at least not compared to, uh, let's say, a Canon R5, but we also need to keep in mind how much they cost. So I think overall both do very well. The Canon might be a bit better. The Panasonic has a nice like kind of trick in its sleeve or an extra feature that you can actually tell the camera if it's stuck on the background that it should come in front to the bird. This is something you don't have with the R R R10. If you shoot a lot of action, you will also be interested of how quick the frame rate is. So let's start with the Canon. With the mechanical shutter, we get up to 15 frames per second. With the electronic shutter, up to 23. With the Panasonic, in the mechanical, we have 10 frames per second with continuous autofocus. And in the electronical, up to 60 frames per second with uh, continuous autofocus. If you don't want autofocus, you can um, even go higher. But for me, this is not really relevant. They also have a pre-burst so that it, they basically start shooting before you fully press the shutter button. And here the Panasonic G9 II offers a bit more flexibility. However, we need to keep some things in mind. This pre-shooting only works with the electronic shutter. And with the electronic shutter, we can have this effect called rolling shutter, which basically distorts part of the images when we move the camera quickly or if the subject moves quickly. 
and here I need to say that the R10 is really not doing a good job. So I had so many distortions that in the end I was not using the R10 in the electronic shutter, but rather in the mechanical shutter. 15 frames per second is still quite quick and I was always using it in this mode or basically always in this mode. The G9 Mark II on the other hand, um, it still can have some rolling shutter, but it's not as pronounced. And if I'm just doing casual flight shots, maybe you see it a bit in the background, but I felt more or less comfortable with it, at least in more situations. However, I had another problem with the camera and that was kind of a lag in the viewfinder. Like that when I was starting to focus and move the camera, it was kind of freezing for a second and then continuing, making it really hard to follow the bird. Um, this is a pre-production model. Maybe it's a problem with this pre-production model. This I just don't know. If I hear anything from Panasonic, I will let you know uh, below. By the way, I'm currently at the firmware 2.0 of the camera. So when I was shooting action, it was more or less stationary, uh, like maybe just birds that were fighting, not moving too much, uh, just some songbirds on a branch, but they were moving a bit quick. I went to 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter, this was just fine. Just when I was doing flying shots, I actually turned this down to the mechanical shutter, which is 10 frames per second, which is still good, but the 15 frames per second here are definitely better. Another important thing is how long can you sustain or can the camera sustain this high frame rate until it drops. Um, and here the R10 is really limited. Even in the mechanical shutter with using zero, I sometimes hit this limit. With the G9 Mark II, I didn't hit it in the mechanical mode. I could imagine it would be easy to hit if you go to 60 frames per second, but if you keep it a bit down, it's much better. But again, don't expect class leading or a performance that you would expect from a camera that costs three times as much. If you want to do some occasional videos with your camera, I think the R10 can manage, but it's no comparison of what the G9 Mark II can achieve. This feels more like a hybrid camera, whereas this is really a photo camera that has some nice video features. I mean, you can shoot 4K 30, but 4K 120, for example, is not possible. This, on the other hand, since the latest firmware update, can even do 5.3K with uh, 30 frames per second. You can shoot 120 frames per second, 4K. Uh, you can do 4K RAW to an external recorder and so on. If it's getting a bit darker outside and you still want to shoot handheld, a good image stabilizer can be very important. Both of these lenses have an optical image stabilizer, but the R10 has no in-body image stabilizer in the camera, whereas the G9 Mark II has. And I was wondering how much of a deal this is, so I did some testing. I shot at 1 30th of a second at 800 millimeter full frame equivalent, so both lenses at their maximum. And then I just checked how many sharp images I got. If I turned the image stabilizer off, it's quite simple, I got actually zero sharp images. If I turned it on on the G9 Mark II, um, I got 17% of blurry images. 40% of okayish images and 43% of really tag sharp images. When I then used the R10, it actually confirmed what I already had the impression in the field, and this was that actually it's not worse than the G9 Mark II. I got 1% of blurry images, 52% of okayish images, and 47% of really tag sharp images. So I would not read too much in the numbers and say that this is much better than a G9 II, but because the stabilizer in the lens is so good, it kind of compensates for not having one in the camera. In general, the IBIS, or so the image uh, stabilizer in the camera, is more important if you have shorter focal length. So if we would strap a wide angle on these two uh, cameras, I could imagine that the results would look quite differently. But that was about bird photography with more focal length. Personally, I often like to have a clean background that is not distracting from the main image. And here we are always struggling a bit if we have smaller sensors with not so fast lenses. So here, of course, don't compare these to a full frame with a um, 600 millimeter f4 attached, for example. However, it's still possible to get some uh, nice shots to isolate the subject if the conditions are right and you know more or less what you're doing. If I did a side-by-side -side comparison, I saw that uh, the Canon R10 with the 100 to 500, with this you're actually able to get a blurrier background. The distance are not crazy, but definitely visible. So in conclusion, both of the systems I think are very suitable. If you have a limited budget, you want to go into bird or wildlife photography in general, and you want a zoom lens that reaches up to 800 millimeters full frame equivalent. Both have their weaknesses and strengths. I think for the Panasonic, the strengths are clearly the nice large viewfinder, more professional body, 
Um, theoretically, it's faster, has some more features. The advantages of the Canon, on the other hand, are uh, that you have a bit better autofocus, a bit better image quality, and uh, the frame rate is actually a bit higher with the mechanical shutter. As I mentioned, the electronic shutter here, I just had some issue. I'm not sure if this is related because this is a prototype or not. So with the Panasonic, you definitely have the more professional camera. Here you have the more professional lens, but cheaper camera. Of course, you could swap the camera here and get an R7, which is already more professional, but this will increase the price as well. At the same time here, you could of course change the lens for something a bit more expensive, so you're flexible here. Something I would really just keep in mind is um, think about the upgrade path in the future. Micro Four Thirds definitely has some lenses, but if you want to at some point maybe spend more money, are willing to carry a bit bigger equipment around, then with the Canon I think you are a bit uh, more future-proof because you can swap the camera for a full-frame camera. And here you are a bit stuck to Micro Four Thirds because the lens is also made for Micro Four Thirds, whereas here this will also work with a full-frame camera such as the R5, R6 Mark II or even the R8. I hope the video was useful. If you want to buy one of these kits, it would be I would be very happy if you do it over the affiliate links that I put below. It would help to support my channel. If you have additional questions, let me know and see you in the next video.